preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. I'm Daniel Stern, Director of Humanities at the 92nd Street Y, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the opening of our two-part series, The Mind and Society, an annual forum sponsored jointly by the Y and the New Criterion. Tonight's event, From Athens to Stanford, The Contact of Liberal Education, is a special evening. I do not use the adjective lightly. One never should use adjectives lightly. Uh, the 92nd Street Y prides itself on being a place in which serious minds may discuss subjects of some significance with some frequency. Yet there cannot be many evenings in which the intellects present are as serious, and certainly there cannot be as many subjects which can make as serious a claim upon our attention as the nature and state of liberal education, tonight's theme. Um, therefore, I'm quite pleased to be introducing tonight's program. Before I introduce our moderator, Samuel Lippman, let me remind you that next Monday, we present the second and final evening of this series with the theme, The Public Intellectual Today. Our guests will be Peter Brooks of Yale, Hilton Kramer, editor of The New Criterion, Norman Podhoritz, the editor of Commentary, and Richard Sennett of NYU. Our moderator tonight and next week is Samuel Lippman, and it is he who will introduce our guests and our evening. But first, a word about Sam Lippman. He is a man of many accomplishments, a musician, critic, author, art executive, and publisher. More specifically, Sam Lippman is the music critic for commentary and the artistic director of the Waterloo Music Festival and School. He's the author of Music After Modernism, published in 1979, The House of Music, published in 1984, and his new collection of essays, Arguing for Music, Arguing for Culture will be published in June. Sam is as well the publisher of our co-sponsor this evening, The New Criterion, a monthly review of ideas and the arts. It's my pleasure now to welcome you to the evening and to Samuel Lippmann, our moderator. Sam? There are many in America today who think that liberal education is the sick man of the academy. Indeed, the medical metaphor seems particularly apt. For some, there is no cure for the present state of liberal education, save the old-time Athenian medicine of great ideas and great texts. For others, only the radical therapy of the new wonder curriculum of Stanford and Points West can provide liberal education with new life. Our speakers tonight are Roger Kimball, Lynn Cheney, and Morris Cowling. Each of them will describe, I believe in quite a different way and from a different perspective, the state of liberal education today and what should be done on its behalf and in its interest. In the process, it is my hope that liberal education itself will be defined and given through pertinent examples its necessary shape. I shall introduce each of our speakers just before he or she appears for the first time. At the conclusion of their remarks, I shall ask them to join in discussion with their colleagues and with me of the points they have made and the questions that have been raised, or perhaps questions that have not been raised. After this discussion, I shall ask for brief questions from the audience. Questions, I pray you, not statements, for our speakers to answer. Our first speaker is Roger Kimball. Mr. Kimball is a graduate of Bennington College and holds an MA and, and, and an MPhil degree from Yale. He is a widely read writer on philosophy, architecture, and higher education. His work has appeared frequently in Architectural Record, Commentary, The Times Literary Supplement in London, The New York Times Book Review, and of course, The New Criterion. 
Mr. Kimball is now the managing editor of the new Criterion, and his book on the Academy today, entitled Tenured Radicals, will be published this March by Harper and Row. Roger Kimball. Thank you. Well, I've been asked to give um, a brief characterization of the present state of liberal education in this country. Um, and the present state of liberal education in this country, I regret to say, is very bad. Uh, humanities enrollments are down. Uh, that's uh, widely acknowledged. Students seem to know less and less when they get to college, and it's not clear that they know much more when they graduate. Uh, there are, uh, this is very widely known, people don't know who Winston Churchill was, they don't know who Joseph Stalin was. Um, they aren't quite sure whether Shakespeare knew Julius Caesar or not. They're not quite sure about the history on that. <clears throat> on the other hand, there is the problem of hyper-specialization in the humanities which seems to go along with a kind of hyper-trivialization, a, a specialization uh, that uh, winds up trivializing uh, uh, the great works uh, and great ideas that form the basis of our, um, of our culture and of the humanities curriculum. But what I want to talk about tonight in particular um, is something that I think is even more troubling, and that is the politicization of the humanities. Um, and by politicization, I mean the use of the humanities um, for ulterior motives, the um, overtaking of the humanities by various interest groups um, who really don't care about humanistic learning or about liberal education, but about various other matters of sociology, of politics, um, uh, and uh, other radical agendas that um, uh, have nothing to do with uh, learning in the traditional sense. Now, the obvious example, um, and the example that is furnished by our title, is Stanford University. And I'm just going to quote a few things from from their uh, curriculum as it's been recently revised. Uh, as you all probably know, Stanford has uh, recently thrown out its required course in the humanities uh, and has substituted for that a series of courses uh, designed to encourage diversity, to uh, capitalize on what has come to be called uh, the multicultural ethic and so forth. And uh, one of these courses features, uh, along with, it must be admitted, uh, readings from Augustine and, and uh, one or two other figures that might be recognizable from the traditional humanistic curriculum, uh, a, a course uh, <clears throat> called the, uh, the, the Europeans and the Americas, in which uh, we have such uh, classes as multicultural selves in the Navajo country, for which students are assigned a film called The Story of a Navajo Family, 1938 through 1986, followed the very next week by a class called Our Bodies, Our Sheep, Our Cosmos, Ourselves, with a reading from Son of Old Man Hat by Left Handed. Now, this is a course that is uh, required um, of all freshmen at Stanford University, one of the great universities in this country. And uh, our bodies, our sheep, our cosmos, ourselves, and similar uh, fodder uh, is being handed to students for a very large sum of money as a kind of replacement for uh, the traditional humanistic education. And it's really kind of a fraud, I think, upon both the students uh, and indeed their parents who are paying for, the, for, this, uh, for this education. But in order to understand how this all came about, and I, I use Stanford as the one example tonight uh, because time is, is brief, but examples can be multiplied endlessly. Uh, 
what, what is behind all this is a new academic establishment, an establishment um, th that I call the establishment of tenured radicals. Um, that is to say, it is the establishment of the university um, that has witnessed the installation of a kind of 1960s and 70s radicalism, uh, which used to be on the outside uh, besieging the university, but is now inside the university in positions of great power and influence, uh, where at one point uh, you, you would see students on the barricades, barricades uh, shouting for um, uh, various reforms and uh, revolutions and uh, overturnings of the established order. Now this radical sentiment is the very part of the faculties of uh, the university. There are the tenured professors, the provosts, the deans, the presidents, uh, the administrators who, uh, and indeed the directors of, hum of the humanities institutes that are cropping up all over the country that are running the universities and educating, um, educating uh, or pretending to educate uh, our children. Now one example of, of this radical ethos um, uh, and again, I'll mention only one because of time, uh, appeared last spring from the American Council of Learned Societies, and it was called Speaking for the Humanities. It was written by seven academics, um, all of whom are influential, tenured professors, uh, six of whom run uh, prestigious uh, humanities institutes at uh, various universities across the country. And the essential message of this pamphlet, which was written uh, in response to uh, books like Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind, to uh, former Secretary of Education William Bennett's um, uh, remarks in education, to our current um, uh, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities' remarks in education. The essential message of this pamphlet was, don't worry. Everything in the, in the academy is really fine. There's nothing to worry about. You've been misled by a lot of um, radicals right radicals who were telling you that things have changed, but really we're still doing the same kind of thing we always did. Um, uh, humanities enrollments really aren't down, or if they are, we can explain it. It's not our fault. It's, it's, everything is really um, just, just as it should be. There was also uh, in this pamphlet an attack, uh, and this is an, another central point, on the very idea of scholarly disinterestedness an attack on the very foundation of what uh, the humanities traditionally had been conceived to be. Uh, indeed, the authors of this pamphlet roundly denounced the idea that uh, the humanities could be something that would one would want to study or could study or should study for their own sakes. Uh, no, the, the humanities really had to begin to be a kind of political tool for these authors. They had to be a kind of means of achieving by, by other uh, methods the radical goals of a tenured elite uh, that could not be achieved um, in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, and just to give you a kind of taste of what sort of thing the authors had in mind, I'll quote from the work of one of the authors, a uh, professor at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, a woman named E. Ann Kaplan, <clears throat> who is also the director of the Humanities Institute there, whose chief claim to scholarly fame is uh, an investigation of rock videos with a specialty in the rock videos of Madonna. Uh, one of her most recent books is called Rocking Around the Clock, Music, Television, Postmodernism, and Consumer Culture. And I apologize in advance for the barbarousness of the, of the rhetoric. But uh, in addition to, in addition to uh, talking about Madonna, she also talked about other um, rock stars, such as uh, Motley Crue, who, do, who uh, sang a song called Smoking in the Boys' Room. Uh, John Cougar Mellencamp, who, who uh, performed a song called Hurt So Good, which she told us, uh, addresses recent interest in sadomasochism on the part of both young men and women. And she went on to, to tell us that, and I'm quoting now, the plethora of gender positions on MTV is arguably linked 
to the heterogeneity of current sex roles and an imaginary constructed out of a world in which all traditional categories, boundaries, and institutions are being questioned. I can't explain to you exactly what that means, but I'll just give you her conclusion. The romantic video functions in the pre-symbolic dyadic terrain between the illusory merging with the mother and the phallicism that follows the mirror phase. Uh, this is a kind of um, uh, conjuries, really, of Lacanian uh, psychoanalytic jargon and feminism, which is rampant in the academy, and uh, which this, uh, uh, which I think characterizes many, many products of it. Now, I won't go on to uh, to detail. Uh, more examples of this, but simply uh, conclude by, by asking the question, what, is the, uh, the, what should the content of a liberal arts education be, and how is it that the, the current problems in the humanities have attacked uh, the, the notion of content? And if one were to reduce it to the, to the uh, uh, essence, I think, what we see is an attack on the very notion of intrinsic worth, of intrinsic merit, of the intrinsic integrity of ideas. The humanities are no longer seen to be something that have worth in themselves, but they are valuable only insofar as they serve a political agenda. Um, and of course, one wants to ask, well, what, what is the alternative then? And I, I'm not going to go back to Athens, although it would be easy to do that, but I'm going to uh, quote from a 19th century thinker, uh, Cardinal Newman, John Henry Cardinal Newman, who in his idea of a university, uh, speaking about what was, the, what was the function of a university, wrote the following. A cultivated intellect, a delicate taste, a candid, equitable, dispassionate mind, a noble and courteous bearing in the conduct of life. These are the objects of the university. And I think that uh, you wouldn't find a single academic uh, in the academy today who would agree to that. And yet, I think it's exactly that, uh, uh, that ideal that we have to look to for the salvation of the uh, liberal arts today. Thank you. We are honored to have as our second speaker, Lynn V. Cheney, the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. She holds a PhD in English literature from the University of Wisconsin, where she wrote her dissertation on the poetry of Matthew Arnold. Mrs. Cheney has been chairman of the NEH since 1985. As chairman of this important federal agency, she has been a prominent, forceful, and articulate spokesman for the humanities in education, and for the necessary relationship between the preservation of democratic values and the study of the humanities. Since coming to the NEH, she has been the author of three widely discussed works on education in America. American Memory, 1987, a report on the humanities in the public schools. Humanities in America, 1988, a report to the President, the Congress, and the American people, and most recently, 50 Hours, 1989, an outline of a possible core curriculum for college students. Mrs. Cheney. Well, let me begin by uh, Reinforcing what Roger said, there is indeed a problem with liberal education in the United States today. And it does seem to me that one way to uh, uh, get evidence, to get some feeling for how great that problem is, is to look at statistics. We at the endowment did a Gallup survey not long ago of what college seniors know about history and literature, and the results were rather dismaying. We released our uh, survey on Columbus Day, and uh, so we gained a great deal of attention across the country since, since as it turned out, one out of every four college seniors uh, could not identify in a multiple choice test the correct half century with when, which Columbus sailed. 
you would have, uh, there were only four possibilities, so you had a one in four chance of uh, getting the question right, but uh, instead uh, uh, the uh, results were not happy at all. A majority of students, a majority of college seniors taking this examination couldn't say what Magna Carta was or Reformation. Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail were clearly mysteries to the majority of students surveyed. One out of every four, when asked to identify a couple of very famous quotations, one about an iron curtain descending across Europe and another about blood, toil, sweat, and tears, one out of every four college seniors said that these were uh, Joseph Stalin's lines. Given a quotation from, uh, well, one of Karl Marx's most oft-repeated phrases, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, one out of every four college seniors said that uh, these words were from the United States Constitution. <laughs> so it, it uh, I think, is evident that there is a problem with liberal education in the United States. Certainly the problem is not confined to our colleges and universities. The results that we see on this survey are, are the uh, consequence of 16 years of education. But there is a great deal of responsibility to be placed in our colleges and universities. In another survey conducted by the National Endowment for the Humanities, we found it was possible to graduate from more than 80% of the colleges and universities in the United States without ever taking a course in the history of Western civilization from almost 80% without ever taking a course in American history, from almost 40% without ever taking any history course at all, from 40% without taking a course in American or English literature, 40% without taking a course in mathematics, uh, more than 35% without taking a course in uh, natural sciences. This is not just a problem in the humanities, though the humanities is, is my chief interest. It is a problem in the sciences as well. The National Science Foundation sent a camera crew to a recent Harvard graduation, and uh, they filmed bright, fresh-faced graduates on this uh, wonderful, sunny day. They were so proud to be receiving their Harvard diplomas. And, and the film crew, with the cameras rolling, asked the graduates uh, to describe why it is that we have seasons. Well, the... The answers were given with a great deal of authority and self-confidence, and they were completely inaccurate. The uh, most common response is we have seasons because, well, you know, in the winter, the sun and the earth are farther from one another. Now, even if you don't know the right answer, you can quickly figure out that that answer doesn't make sense, since according to that uh, line of reasoning, it would be winter in Canberra, Australia, as well as in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts at, at the same time. So it's a problem across the curriculum, a problem in the sciences and mathematics as well as in the humanities. <laughs> One uh, point that Roger mentioned, the politicization of the curriculum uh, is a difficulty. Even if uh, requirements are in place and they are good ones, it's not always possible to predict how well a curriculum, a given curriculum, um, will be taught. But sometimes you don't even have to ask that question. You can see simply by the outline of the course whether uh, uh, a politicized approach is, uh, has taken place. And Stanford is a good example of uh, a case in which uh, the curriculum has been politicized. I have my own special examples I like to talk about from uh, the new Stanford course. They had 15 great books, you see, that every freshman used to read. And uh, they threw uh, a lot of them over the side, including Homer and Dante, and replaced them with other readings. Uh, one of the new readings is uh, France Fanon, uh, an Algerian psychoanalyst who uh, advocates violent third world revolution. Another of the new readings is a book called I, Rigoberta Menchu, which is uh, the autobiography of a leftist feminist Guatemalan revolutionary. The rationale for the Stanford curriculum actually I find attractive. The idea is that we need to know more than the West. And this argument was advanced. And I find that convincing. We need to know the West, but we need, in a world that is more and more interdependent, to know other cultures as well. Stanford actually had in place a good plan for this. If, if uh, the old curriculum had been preserved and well taught, a Western sequence 
great books of the West, 15 great books of the West. And then a requirement that students study another culture as well. This seems to me a perfectly reasonable plan, one that, uh, that bodes well. But um, Stanford somehow made this, put this awful dichotomy in place. If we're going to study the West, somehow it will diminish us from knowing about other cultures. That simply isn't true. The uh, collegiate mind can, uh, can, keep, uh, can keep both in mind at once. The only point, Roger, with which I would take serious disagreement is your assertion that uh, you wouldn't find a single academic in uh, the United States today who would agree with uh, uh, Newman's description of what a university ought to be. I think that there are people in the academy who are dedicated to the idea of liberal education. There are people in the academy that want to pass along the best that has been thought and known to the next generation. These people are there. They deserve our help, our support. Often their lot is a hard one. They find it difficult to make their case. I hope that we at the endowment with publications like 50 Hours, which sets forth a, a model curriculum, can give moral support to those people on our campuses today who do wish to provide uh, a plan for entering students who do wish to provide some sort of answer to entering students about what an educated person should know. An answer that, that is both uh, conservative of our own heritage and uh, uh, which introduces students to other cultures around the world as well. Our final speaker in this section of the evening will be Morris Cowling. Mr. Cowling was born in London in 1926 and was educated at Battersea Grammar School and Jesus College, Cambridge, where he read history. He was a fellow of Jesus College from 1950 to 1953, and after a period spent chiefly in London, returned to Jesus as a fellow in 1961. At Cambridge, he has been reader in modern English history, and since 1963, he has been a fellow of Peterhouse, where he has been perhaps the leading figure in an intellectual movement variously called the Peterhouse School of History and the Peterhouse Right. Mr. Cowling has written books entitled The Nature and Limits of Political Science, 1963, Mill and Liberalism in the Same Year, 1867, Disraeli, Gladstone and Revolution, 1967, the Impact of Labor, 1920-1924, in 1971. The Impact of Hitler, 1933-1940, written in 1975. And Religion and Public Doctrine in England, Volume 1, 1980, and Volume 2, 1985. All of these books have been published by the Cambridge University Press. Mr. Cowling was literary editor of the English magazine Spectator, in 1970 and 1971, and in 1978 he edited conservative essays. In the fall term of 1989, he was the John M. Olin Visiting Professor in the Department of Religion at Columbia University. Because Morris Cowling has written so many influential works, and because in these works he has never shied away from clear expression and strong statements, I would like to ask him to respond to several sentences of his own. It seems to me that these sentences, drawn from his introduction to the new Cambridge paperback edition of Mill and Liberalism, go straight to the heart of tonight's discussion of liberal education. The Peterhouse Wright, Mr. Cowling has written, is mistrustful of higher education as it has developed in Britain in the last 25 years. It believes that if higher education is to be extensive, it should educate practical capabilities, and wishes that the expansion could have been vocational and technological. It also believes that the sort of education which British universities have provided since the middle of the 19th century is valuable in the sciences as well as in the humanities, provided that there is a lot less of it than there is at present. Morris Cowling.
Perhaps I would say, first of all, that I don't generally use the phrase liberal education. I use the phrase academic education, and I mean by that an education which, though like a medical or legal or engineering education, may have a practical or vocational use, is designed primarily to explain and understand the world, the world of nature and of man. I think a lot of the depression that's felt about literary and liberal education, certainly in England, perhaps here, arises from a feeling that it's inferior to a scientific education. And the first point I want to make is that a scientific and a humane or liberal education, in one very important respect, are doing exactly the same thing. They're not designed for any practical purpose, except the purpose of understanding. And from that point of view, there is no reason whatever to assume that a humane or liberal or whatever word you like to use, education, is in any way inferior to a scientific education, which itself is not really concerned with practical results, but with understanding, just as a humane or liberal education is. And there's really no need for anybody who is concerned about a humane or liberal education to feel any, the need to apologize for it or to feel that it's not useful, important, in an intellectual and understanding sense. Now, the second thing I want to say is this. It's that university education, it's like school education, but I think it's even more the case that it depends on what teachers think. It's intellectually reputable to teach. Now, legislators, administrators, and grant-giving bodies obviously have an effect. But it's the teacher who is at the heart of the activity and the process. And what teachers have been trying to do in England since the 1860s, let us say, has been to combine teaching, learning, and research. Teaching, learning, and research, I would say in equal proportions, and to allow these three to influence each other, interact with each other, as they teach undergraduates. Some people are good at one activity, other people are good at another activity, some people are good at all. But that, combined with a semi-pastoral and personal concern for pupils, has, I think, on the whole, in the last 120 years, been the norm in British universities and I think on the whole, until about 20 years ago, it worked. Because everybody understood that the ultimate aim was the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, uh, really regardless of practical consequences, and there were enough students who were able to profit from that sort of education. Now, the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, rather than for the sake of a practical purpose or for the sake of earning a living, uh, is a very odd activity. Uh, I don't think very large numbers of people are suited for it. I think quite a lot of students are actually damaged by it at a crucial phase in their lives. And I suspect that what the less good ones learn from it is, is not the difficulty of knowing, but simply how to be idle. I hope there's no one here from the University of Hull in England, but really what I'm saying is that I find it very difficult to believe that a graduate with an indifferent degree in sociology from the University of Hull is likely to have learnt really anything about the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. 
and I'm sure that he would, or she would learn much more practically and be better prepared for life if instead of being an, given an education which he or she is not capable of really dealing with, he or she were trained to be a policeman or a social worker or a local government worker or a clergyman or whatever. <laughs> in other words, in the modern academic <laughs> university, there's a problem about numbers. How many people ought to have, how many people are suited for a non-vocational education? Now, there has in England, in the last 25 years, since the Robbins report, been a vast expansion in the size and numbers of British universities. I believe that saturation point for academic education was reached probably 25 years ago, let us say 20 years ago. I believe that it's actively desirable to contract the size of academic universities. And I wonder whether Mrs. Cheney and Roger Kimball agree with me about that in the United States. But we, they can t t t tell us later. The next thing I want to say is simply a word about the question of method that's proper for a literary or liberal as distinct from a scientific education. Now, Sam Lipman has mentioned, and Mrs. Cheney has mentioned, the study of great <coughs> texts. And the study of great texts certainly is one such method. But it isn't at all the only method. Many modern subjects simply don't proceed by studying great texts. Anthropology doesn't proceed in that way. Archaeology merges into physics and carbon dating. History, which is one of the main humane subjects in all universities in the world, doesn't necessarily depend on great texts. It can depend on physical artifacts, landscape, political papers, private papers, it doesn't necessarily depend on great texts, and so on. Now, I'm not against the study of great texts. Indeed, it's what I chiefly teach in the form of the history of political thought and have taught for a long time in Cambridge. What I'm saying is that it's a great mistake to put all the liberal, humane eggs into that basket. It's necessary to remember the variety of the ways in which a liberal or humane education can be conducted. It's essential not to be afraid of any method that the academic person proposes. And it's desirable to understand very clearly that the only methods that ought to be adopted are those which are produced and approved of by the minds of those who conduct the subjects and do the teaching. Now, in dealing with the question whether a method or a subject is suitable for, in for inclusion in a humane or a liberal education, one has got, it seems to me, to make a judgment, and this is where I agree with Mrs. Cheney and with Roger, it's necessary to make a judgment not of fashion, but of difficulty and illumination. Is the subject that's proposed for study difficult as well as illuminating? And are its illuminations connected with its difficulty? Can its difficulty be understood without being rather limited in its scope. Now, Mrs. Cheney won't mind, I'm sure, if I say that her pamphlet, 50 Hours, the object and integrity of which I respect very greatly, does seem to me to expect the student and the teacher 
to, so, to cover so much ground in so limited a time that what one really expects to result, result is a flip through the history of world literature, much of which the teacher won't know very much about, where what really needs to be acquired from any sort of humane education is this deep sense of difficulty, a sense of the difficulty in understanding the truth about anything. I know that Mrs. Cheney was addressing a different problem, that there is a belief, which I have no means of commenting on, that American students are very ignorant and are also culturally very diverse and that they need something to bring them together into a sort of cultural unity. But I still wonder whether the pursuit of a common culture, if that's what is being suggested, won't end really in what Mrs. Cheney obviously detests, a sort of vague pap which doesn't have any sense of difficulty. This leads me finally to the question whether a liberal or humane education ought to teach spiritual values. It's a thing that Sam Lipman suggested we ought to talk about. I'm not saying that it should, uh, should that it shouldn't, or really that it can avoid doing so, if only by implication. But I am mistrustful of the idea that a university course should teach spiritual values, because the phrase spiritual values seems to me to conceal an uncertainty, perhaps an embarrassment, about the role of religion in a society in which there is no one accepted religion. I realize that the phrase spiritual values often reflects a desire to preserve religion of any sort against irreligion of all sorts. All I'm just wondering in the end is whether the idea that a liberal education should teach values isn't really in a way a recipe for the death, or perhaps even a recognition of the death of religion, uh, rather than an assistance to it. So what I'm really saying about British education is that British liberal higher education isn't too bad, that it certainly isn't as bad as Roger and perhaps Mrs. Cheney thinks American liberal higher education are, but that the chief thing that's wrong with it is that there is a certain amount of what they are both describing, and that in any case, there is all far too much of it. I think the best way to proceed now would be to ask each of the panelists, particularly uh, Roger Kimball and Lynn Cheney, to comment um, on what their other, their colleagues have said. Um, I think that these comments ought to be fairly short, particularly because I have in mind trying to draw together uh, by a few questions some of the strands that have already emerged in this discussion. Roger, do you want to lead off? Sure. Um, well, I, I have to plead guilty to uh, a certain exaggeration. Yes, I, I should have said there's not, any, there's not a single academic. Uh, rather, I should have said there's, the, the number is statistically insignificant who believe in, uh, in, in Newman's um, characterization of, of education. Otherwise, I, I, I didn't find anything to take issue with, really, in, in Mrs. Cheney's comments. Um, and Professor Colleen's comments, I, I um, he wanted to ask, he asked us to respond. I, I guess I would have to agree, um, dangerous though it may be to agree, that uh, too many people um, are 
uh, in college today because they aren't really getting a college education. And so they're being sold a bill of goods. And even worse, um, those who do want a college education are finding it more and more difficult to, to get one because um, the value of their education is being continually diluted. Um, I think I'll leave my comments at that for the moment. <clears throat> oh, my. Well, uh, a couple of points. Uh, Morris, uh, I think that uh, perhaps Roger and I have participated in these discussions so many times that we've developed a kind of shorthand that perhaps we were guilty of. When uh, I talk about great books, I don't simply mean the study of great books. I mean the study of great books, great figures, and great events. And you think this could go without saying in education that these things should be the focus of attention. But indeed, it cannot go without saying uh, when we see the results of uh, surveys, for example, uh, showing that uh, Magna Carta, the Federalist Papers, such things are uh, completely unknown. There is a sense in which all youngsters ought to study greatness. And it, uh, it connects with what uh, you were talking about in terms of the moral purpose of, uh, of higher education. Whitehead once said that the uh, groundwork of uh, morals uh, lay in the apprehension of greatness. And what he was really saying is that we need some sort of concrete models to draw us to greatness, to, to conceive of moral greatness in, in uh, the abstract is, is not entirely useful in education. So that focus on greatness, great books, great figures, great events strikes me as very important. And I would disagree with both uh, you and Roger on the subject of who ought to have such an education. I think whoever wants such an education ought to have it, and that we would be very ill-advised to uh, limit severely the number of people who could have access to this kind of education, partly because it develops perspective, it develops judgment. It, uh, it develops the, the skills that are useful uh, across a, a, a range of professions. Um, Sam pointed out that I did my dissertation on uh, uh, one of your uh, countrymen, Matthew Arnold, who not only believed that the best that had been thought and known should be taught, but believed that it ought to be made as widely known as possible. And that seems to me the, the only possible goal for us in a democracy, is to aim at making the best that has been thought and known as widely available as possible. Would, yes. would you, would you, I really want to ask um, Lynn Cheney a question. Um, would you not agree that there are certain sorts of education, this sort of education, what I call an academic education, um, that really is not suitable to very large numbers of people. I mean, um, y you perhaps are speaking uh, as a para-politician. No, in I'm a, speaking a, no, quite no, genuinely. I'm not, 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 not I'm not trying to be offensive. Para-politician is an interesting a phrase, though. <laughs> um, in, a, in, a, in a democratic society. Um, um, but um, it must surely be the case that... Um, <laughs> You know, a, a, a sweet, not very bright girl. Oh, now, Let wait. No, no, wait, wait. I don't, I'm, a sweet, not very bright girl who's going to uh, a not very good, let us say, liberal arts college, um, would probably be better advised um, to be preparing for a job. Give me an example of how she might do this. What course would you recommend for her? You wanted to major in journalism or... Uh Secretarial yes, I, science, I or to do something um, that would help her to earn a living more readily than spending three years, or, or however long it may be, um, uh, really in in the foothills um, of a, a subject which it's very difficult to master. And um, I mean, I know perfectly well in England, and I, I, I can't believe that it's not the case here. But I'm. I'm ignorant of the United States, I'm simply asking. I can't believe that there aren't far too many people having an academic education as distinct from a vocational one. Well, you and I just disagree fundamentally on this point. First of all, I find it, uh, I find myself always very unsure about declaring that this uh, sweet young person be uh, the person male or female. 
is um, to be declared incompetent at uh, 19, 20, or 21 uh, for a, a leadership role later in life. Uh, one of the glories of American education, and there are many failings, and uh, Roger and I talk about those every chance we get, but one of the glories of American higher education is that it provides chances to so many people and second chances. I sometimes think of it as the land of the second chance. You know, you may, you may not do well in your exams here or there. You may not do well at your first opportunity, but you've got that second chance. It's always there. And I know so many people who uh, did well only on their second chance or sometimes on their third chance or, or who bloomed um, lately. And so I, I'm very hesitant to declare a 19 or 21 year old uh, but why incompetent does, why for does academic the education. Why does the ladder of achievement have to be an academic education? Why can't it be a vocational one? Well, perhaps we in this country haven't perfected vocational education, but I can say to you that I think most people who major in vocations at college or university have wasted their money far more uh, drastically than people who have majored in liberal education. Even though they don't know what the Magna Carta was? These people who graduated from a liberal arts well, education, and so I mean, we have, well, this the, the survey that I'm talking about uh, was uh, uh, cross uh, major boundaries. Yeah. Only one out of every 16 in that survey was a humanities major, because only one out of 16 majors could in the I, humanities in college or university. Bring something into this discussion that might clarify, and I don't think it will uh, compose the differences, <clears throat> but I think it might ameliorate them a bit. Uh, there are, it seems to me, aren't there the most important differences between the tasks which historically education has been set in England and the tasks which it has been set in the United States? Um, the, the, essentially, the tasks, it's the task which education has been set in the United States, it seems to me, is the making of a nation that um, historically we have, uh, uh, even from, the time, from before the time of Horace Mann, we have attempted to use education to bind together the nation. And we have, of course, the whole uh, uh, philosophy of the common school. And indeed, um, uh, for the most romantically inclined of us, uh, universal higher education is an offshoot of the common school. In England, it seems to me, the idea of higher education much more comes out of the training of the clergy. It much more comes out of a restricted attempt to provide what Coleridge called the clerisy, rather than to provide a whole nation with its understanding of the political society and the cultural society. Now, I think we can afford, for this moment, to disagree on these things because I don't think the English and American situations mesh very easily. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned, and I want to ask you all about this, I'm more concerned about something that arises out of Roger's mention of Cardinal Newman. Of course, Cardinal Newman's uh, marvelous, beautiful, I would say, work in this area, the idea of university, uh, makes this case for a liberal education as the study of the study in disinterestedness and the cultivation of taste, what he called the making of a gentleman. Um, can we, Roger, and I would ask you because you brought disinterestedness into this discussion, can we really assume that such disinterestedness is possible in the United States when the cultural environment in which one is supposed to be disinterested barely exists? in which disinterestedness might be just another uh, way of saying anarchy? Uh, well, I would say yes, we can, but I don't see how disinterestedness could be another way of saying anarchy exactly, but I think it's very difficult, and I think that um, the only way in which that is going to be a productive uh, view of higher education is if higher education can be depoliticized? Well, don't you think, Morris, that when we look at, when you look, when we look at education in England, we look at what Newman had to say, that Newman was taking for granted the existence of Christianity? 
That is, well, the existence no, the, of Christianity as the vivifying force in the values, in the, in the lives of the nation? Well, when Roger mentioned his interestedness, um, uh, it struck me that um, both in Dublin, in, in the lectures on university education, and in Oxford, um, what Newman was trying to do was to ensure that English education was governed by Christian intention. Um, he looks reactionary in Oxford because he's addressing what he thinks is a rationalist society or a rationalist church even. He looks progressive and liberal in Dublin because he's addressing um, reactionary or bog Irish priests, he thinks. Um, but the intention in both cases is the same, and I'm not sure that disinterestedness is really quite the right word with which to characterize Newman. Newman wanted there to be a Christian education, and the disinterestedness is, is subordinate to it. And I think that it, it does actually raise another difficulty, I mean, the, the mention of disinterestedness. Um, one of the things that one associates with the phrase liberal education is disinterestedness. But if you look at what, particularly in the humanities, um, in England, I'm sure it's the same in the United States or anywhere else, um, a liberal education <coughs> produces in terms of literature. It's not a disinterested literature, often. It's a partial, it's a liberal literature which is contentiously and deliberately liberal uh, and not a disinterested one. Now there's a very narrow uh, line between um, an academic literature which is liberal in the sense that it's disinterested in its intellectual intention and um, an academic literature which is liberal in the sense that it is proposing a dogmatic or aggressive liberalism. Well, I'd like to ask, ask Lynn. Um, we've, we've now raised this word disinterest. And I wonder, <coughs> how do you feel about <coughs> the, the use of this word? Uh, we're, coming into, we're coming into a situation where I think we can all agree that what we're looking at in American liberal, liberal education is not disinterestedness, is not the practice of disinterestedness. Does disinterestedness have a future is in, in, in American higher education? Is it, a, is it a worthwhile goal? Well, it certainly should. Uh, Arnold uh, talked about disinterestedness as being the free play of the mind over ideas. And uh, this seems to me to be an academic ideal. One of the reasons that uh, it is so important that we continue to teach the history of Western civilization in our colleges and universities is simply because it provides such an ideal vehicle for a disinterested approach to ideas. You simply cannot teach Western civilization without bringing up ideas that clash how would you, and that uh, counter how one another. How would we, uh, you and Roger, I think, have now the burden of trying to define disinterestedness, don't you? Well, if this is an interesting thing to pursue much further. What? If this is an interesting question to pursue much further. Well, I, I'm happy to I think it. I'm afraid that it. I'm afraid that it really lies at the core of our attempt to resist what I think we all agree is pretty dreadful stuff. Because the, if we're going to resist, isn't the question in whose name do we resist? Roger? Well, I, I think that... Uh, I mean, uh, Mrs. Cheney mentioned uh, Matthew Arnold. He defined it quite well. I mean, it's the disinterested view of a subject is one in which it is not motivated by an ulterior purpose. It doesn't mean that one doesn't speak from a, a particular point of view or one doesn't have a particular perspective on something or one isn't uh, interested in the larger sense in the questions of value that are raised, but that one doesn't, it's not, uh, it's not pursued for any ulterior purpose, whether it's political or religious or um, uh, material for gain. Well, Lynn, do you want to 
Do you want to comment on that? You, 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 you may not want to go on with, with this. I, I, I know this is a, a naughty and uh, abs, abstract Well, I mean, it's, you know, to be fair, we need to present the viewpoint of the other side, which right. says that disinterestedness is impossible that all thought is political, all texts are political, and that we simply have to recognize this and teach honestly, making our biases clear from the outset. This is a point of view I simply reject. It may not be possible in this imperfect world to achieve complete objectivity, but it has to be the goal of academic life, in my opinion. Uh, the uh, opposing side would hold that that is highly unrealistic, uh, that we are all political animals all the time, and so we should just admit our biases and get on with them. But you see, I, I'm, I'm sure as reactionary or conservative, whatever the word is that we use as you are. Oh, more. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I'm not sure that, um, I mean, I don't care for the language of objectivity. I mean, I don't, I know there is a philosophical argument that one can use about it, but I don't, um, I don't see why one has to insist on the language of objectivity. Uh, I didn't see why, I don't see why Roger feels that the people he's attacking, uh, who I'm sure he's attacking quite rightly, and I'm sure I, uh, uh, you know, would attack them too. I don't think the ground on which um, they're being attacked is um, a plausible ground. Uh, and I think you're associating a conservative position in education with a philosophical position, i.e. about objectivity, which it doesn't need to be associated with. You can have an irrationalist conservatism, uh, you can have a subjective conservatism, and there's no reason why you shouldn't have it. And but, but, uh, the, 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 the confusion of a conservative position with a philosophical position seems to me a very, very great mistake. I think this, uh, this argument has become too abstract. And let's bring it down to, to a real concrete example. And I think, that, let's go back to the Stanford curriculum again and to uh, replacing Homer and Dante with Frantz Fanon, who does indeed advocate violent third world revolution. I think, I, I, though I would hate, I hate the idea of replacing a great book with Frantz Fanon. I have no objection to teaching Frantz Fanon. As long as in the curriculum someplace, the opposing view appears. As long as Gandhi is taught, perhaps, if you want to do great books from, from uh, many cultures or great thinkers from many cultures. This is a point that Sidney Hook made shortly before he died. The point of an education is to allow the mind to play freely with ideas. But an uneducated youngster can't play freely with the idea of a violent third world revolution unless he or she also has some grounding in what the opposition might be. When I talk about objectivity, perhaps I do it sloppily. Literature is my field as opposed to philosophy. What I simply mean is there ought to be some chance to see both sides of the question, and there shouldn't in the classroom be this narrow focusing in, this insistence that one side is correct. I teach in a dogmatic way. Um, and, and, uh, but Morris, you also nothing, love fights. So. No, 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 nothing you are talking about <coughs> describes the way I teach at all. It doesn't, and, and I am, you know, on your side. Yes, uh, Morris, I, I, I must say that I would uh, oppose the uh, intrusion of politics from the right as much as from the left. I mean, I, I do believe in the, dis, the ideal of disinterestedness. Uh, I, and I think that it is not only philosophically, but also as a pedagogical uh, tool. Is there, is, there anything, um, is there anything that you feel has not been raised so far? That is, this, this, this question of, of values. I think uh, uh, I had in mind that we might talk for a moment about whether spiritual values, I, I didn't use the word spiritual, but, but whether values should be taught or whether, and, and if values should be taught, which values? Is there, and does anyone want to address that? Well, just uh, since Newman has been mentioned several times here, in the idea of a university, he, he goes to great pains to say that the, the end of a liberal education, a, a humane education, uh, is knowledge. It's not values. And knowledge is one thing, he says, virtue is another. We shouldn't burden uh, a liberal education with virtue, with trying to teach virtue. And while I think that in some large sense, 
there is a virtue to uh, truth, to, to the acquisition of knowledge. That in itself is a virtue. And the, the list that I quoted from Arnold is a, a catalog of virtues, equanimity, candidness, all these, these are virtues. And yet I feel that he's right, that they are distinct. And I would, I would not want to reduce education to a kind of catechism. One of the reasons that I think that uh, liberal education is important uh, for as many people as uh, wish to pursue it, and one of the reasons that I'm deeply concerned about what's happened to enrollments in the humanities over the last 20 years, it used to be that one out of every six students majored in the humanities, now it's <coughs> one out of 16. One of the reasons that, uh, one of the reasons that, that that concerns me is because study of the humanities the uh, study of liberal, uh, study in liberal education takes you to questions of value. I don't think properly it uh, resolves them for you, uh, at least not right away. The, the professor is not to do that, but it takes you to those enduring questions of uh, value. If you read great books and study great figures and great events, you have, you will inevitably come to those questions about what is the nature of virtue, uh, what is the nature of a uh, satisfying life? How does one live with dignity? Uh, you get to those questions through liberal education, the study of the humanities. You don't always get to the resolution. That's much harder. I think at this point, I'd like to open it up to the people in the audience. If we, if we have any questions, and, and remember, I pray you uh, questions, not statements. Yes. The interesting thing is that the SAT exam, which is essentially an entrance exam for higher education in this country, sets the stage for anti intellectualism, trivialization, uh, as opposed to other countries like Britain, uh, France, Israel, etc., who have real achievement exams rather than simply uh, so called uh, aptitude exams. That's a very good observation. I couldn't agree with you more. I've been very outspoken about the SAT over these last few years. The verbal component is what I'm most uh, competent to talk about. And in its verbal component, the SAT doesn't care what you've learned. It doesn't care if you know when the Civil War was or what Magna Carta is or what the purpose of the Federalist Papers uh, was. It only cares if you know how to manipulate analogies. Can you determine whether a triangle is more like a human being or a wheelbarrow? Um, and and the, the, it, it corrupts our system of education by focusing on these questions as opposed to what one has learned as uh, examinations in almost all other industrialized nations, uh, not just Britain, uh, do. It also uh, corrupts the system by taking time out of the classroom. My youngsters in their last year in high school spent endless hours in English class learning to manipulate analogies and memorizing <laughs> vocabulary in an abstract way simply for the purpose of doing well in the SAT. So it, it's, in my opinion, a very uh, bad measure for us of what our students have achieved and uh, certainly a terrible way to measure our schools. Morris, what do you think about the English uh, uh, in, 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 in Oxford and Cambridge, the, uh, the setting of papers and so on, that method of examination? Well, I'm... I'm in two minds. I mean, I, I accept the system and I work it. And um, uh, examinations are um, desirable as spurs to work and tests of achievement. I do also tend to think that with really good people, um, they can be a great burden and a nuisance. And I mean, this is you know, at a high level. I, I'm not um, a dogmatic believer in the examination system at all. Is, is that what you're asking? Well, there's a great difference between the American emphasis upon uh, so-called objective questions. Oh, no, it's not even objective and the, questions. And the English uh, insistence upon uh, what we call here essay questions. But you see, the SAT is now going to some essay questions, and that still doesn't solve the fundamental problem that the SAT is not related to curriculum. It doesn't care what you know. It tries to test the phrase the Education Testing Service uses, developed ability, whatever that well, means. Well, Lynn, the, isn't the purpose, isn't, isn't the problem then to decide who sets what you should know? 
isn't the use of the, uh, I, I happen to loathe the SATs myself, but isn't the problem that, that the SATs are an attempt to escape from this problem of what anyone ought to know, that is, it's, an, it's our good old American democratic attempt to avoid the discussion of ultimate problems of ultimate value. Isn't that the, isn't that the difficulty here? It certainly is a difficulty. I mean, who gets to decide what it is that youngsters ought to know? We are moving right. in the direction of having somebody decide it as we sit here and speak, though. The National Assessment of Education Progress, which is an arm of the Educational Testing Service, is developing a national report card across the curriculum. And uh, that examination is going to be a very powerful force in driving curriculum. We ought to be paying attention to uh, who's deciding Are you in favor of a national know. curriculum? No, I'm not. I am in favor of national goals and standards, however. I think we can arrive at some kind of uh, determination about levels of achievement that youngsters ought to be able to demonstrate, and then it's up to the individual school to decide how to get there. Roger, do you want to comment on this? Next question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but but, but um, um, expand on it, uh, uh, Roger. Uh, do you feel that that question uh, perhaps does, does raise a very important problem, which is uh, uh, for whom does the educational system exist? Does it exist for the students or does it exist for the faculty? Alas, all too often it exists for the administrators, but, but uh, failing that for the faculty often. I, I would agree with Mrs. Cheney that that uh, with she, when she quoted Matthew Arnold, I think that uh, liberal education should be available to as many people as possible. But I would want a, a liberal education to be available and to as many people as possible. And I think we might disagree that what people were getting was a liberal education and that how many people could actually partake of it, uh, of the numbers. Know, there, there's this assumption here that is uh, uniquely American. Perhaps it's also British, but it certainly uh, doesn't exist in all cultures, that there is this innate ability that you were born with. And that will chiefly indicate whether or not you're capable of this thing called liberal education. Japanese simply don't believe in it the way we do. And I think their schools work much better as a result. They think that you learn according to how hard you work and that ability is very, very minor compared to how hard you work. I think I, I would prefer us not to uh, place so much emphasis early on about, you know, some of these people are gonna be okay for this, but some of them aren't. I'd, I'd like to see the system wide open and, and a constant emphasis on standards, a constant emphasis on making sure that uh, what would happen to the people then who fail? Some people will fail. Many people will fail. The wider the net liberal education casts, if standards are kept high, more people will fail. What will we do with them? But they get a second chance. Well, but, but life is not infinite in duration. I, I, I'm, I, I personally, you know, I, actually, I personally if... have the difficulty in that I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, broad church person in education. I feel that as many people should achieve uh, some kind of, 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 of higher education as is possible. But I don't feel that that is true for an intellectual reason. I feel that it's true for a political and social reason. So I have a, a little different problem, but, but I, I, that doesn't seem to uh, catch fire, that, that approach. Uh, Morris, what do you? Well, I've said what I think before. 
I think that um, the, I mean, I, I, I don't want to pontificate, pontificate about the United States, which I know far too little about. But um, listening to Mrs. Cheney and to Roger, um, what I get the feeling is, is that they are not facing the question. Um, are some, is um, an academic education, in my sense, um, suitable for very large numbers of people? I think it isn't. Um, uh, but you don't seem to, you know, you just reject that out of hand. That's true. Really, in, 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 in a sort of democratic sense, uh, and from a, a democratic point of view. Next question. It, seem, it seems a, a suitable point of view for a citizen of the United States. Yes, I, well, I, well, I well, agree I know, about yes. that. that. That's absolutely true, but we have problems. Yes? Why have uh, trustees and alumni been so uh, passive? That's a good question. They're cowards. Well, I don't think they know the issues. I don't think they understand the uh, uh, alternatives to the system in place. First of all, we have a system in which faculties dominate curricula. I mean, that's simply the case. It is the faculty that decides what will and will not be taught. Uh, administrators and trustees, though, could provide valuable leadership if they knew what the issues were. What I find when I talk to trustees especially is that they're very important people and they're very busy and they have big jobs. That's how you get to be a trustee, you know, is that if you've got to, an important job and often the ability to support the university or college handsomely. So you're very busy and you don't have time to get into these things that Roger and I spend a lot of our lives worrying about. One of the things I hope the latest endowment report does by explaining issues of the curriculum in a very simple and straightforward way is bring uh, trustees up to speed, so to speak, so that they can enter the discussion at a, at a higher level and perhaps uh, provide more leadership than they have. But isn't a reluctance to rock the boat also one of the chief qualifications for many trustees? I don't find that at all. I mean, the trustees I know, uh, examples I can think of are uh, uh, people very much involved in the decision-making process of American business, and that tends to give you uh, a decided viewpoint on the world, but they're just sort of flabbergasted by what happens on campuses. They really don't understand the issues and the alternatives, and that's important. It's an educational effort that needs to be undertaken. David? had so many anti-cowlings on any faculty I've ever been on that um, you know my answer. But you make a very good point. The best curriculum can be corrupted by a lack of disinterestedness, by a lack of objectivity. It is possible to hold every uh, great book you can think of up as an example of some kind of oppression or another, and to do that at great length uh, throughout the class period which may be an interesting point worth making in part of the class period, but surely there is more to the great books than uh, the fact that they have uh, somehow oppressed people, and that, too, uh, deserves to be made known to the students. Yes. Could you stand up? I think it might be better, yes.
Well, who would like to? Like that, that's really asking whether uh, there ought not to be a, uh, an increased contemporary relevance for what is studied in general education. No, I thought it was a slightly well, questionable, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought he was saying that there is a problem that the teacher speaks and the pupil writes, but nothing goes on in the pupil's mind. Is that what he was saying? Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, that seems to me a matter of teaching method and technique. And I do think that, as far as I understand it, the norm in American universities is the lecture, to some extent the seminar. Now, the norm that I've been accustomed to is the tutorial, which means that I teach one person an hour a week. And it isn't possible when you're teaching a person for an hour a week um, on a, an intimate basis that the relationship between what I say and what the student writes should be as negligible as the questioner is describing the process. Now, it's a very expensive way of teaching. Um, and I can see that it can't be adopted, but that is the answer to the question. That, that is the resolution of the problem. Lynn, what would you think about the, the issue of relevance, that is, of, uh, of, 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 of studying uh, 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 the past in light of the present, or the present in light of the past, bringing the two intimately together on a, on a daily basis? I did hear that other part to the question, which is uh, you offered the reason uh, for the subject passing from the teacher through the pen to the paper without thought, uh, and that was basically uh, students not seeing relevance. A uh, number of papers, including the Washington Post, have done articles these last few weeks about the events in Eastern Europe, and the Post in particular had a poignant one that talked about teachers coming into the classroom and they themselves had remembered you know, when the Berlin Wall went up and they came into the classroom so emotional about this moment, this great moment in human history when it was going down and when the people of Eastern Europe were rising up and putting uh, uh, the necessity for self-determination clearly in front of their governments and, and achieving the possibility of uh, self-determination. The teachers would come into class and the students would be absolutely unmoved because they had no historical context to understand these ideas. And one teacher said, how can they know that the death of communism is significant when they don't know what communism is? Well, my, my point is, is that the great books are relevant. Marx is relevant to the present moment. Locke is relevant to the present moment. Jefferson is relevant to the present moment. It is indeed a tragedy if uh, teaching fails to make that clear that uh, the great books are great simply because generation after generation have found those books and those ideas to be applicable, indeed central to, to human life. Yes. Next. Yes. You, you, you don't mean those terms with the Jordan? <laughs>
conservative and liberal intellectuals who are concerned about these issues, frankly, about how they intend to do battle with these people and how they intend to influence academic life. Well, I think that the, the rhetoric of power, which you're quite right, is central to a lot of academic discourse, as I say these days, um, is part and parcel of the attack on objectivity, uh, yes, on objectivity and disinterestedness. It's because uh, they reject those notions that they are able to say that everything is political, and a corollary of that is everything is a kind of a coefficient of power relationship. So part of the I ideal of... Um, uh, rescuing the ideals of, of disinterestedness and objectivity is uh, to also attack that notion that everything in academia can be seen in terms of a kind of uh, nefarious power relationship. You talk about power, and that's a very good question, because how, how does one bring change to a, a, a situation that uh, often does lack objectivity? One of the most uh, moving conversations I've ever had, I had recently with a conservative academic, and he described to me his life. He described to me what it's like to present ideas and have them ignored or ridiculed. He described to me what it's like to uh, uh, fear for uh, teaching, uh, for bringing students along in uh, your mode of thinking into graduate school, knowing that they may have difficulty getting a job if uh, they write uh, a dissertation on something so traditional, say, as Matthew Arnold's uh, poetry. So how, how, how does one introduce more objectivity into this situation? It seems to me that one of the levers of power here is the fact that it is those of us in this room, it is parents, uh, who are footing the bill at American colleges and universities, and that, in fact, we have choice in this system. We do not have to go to X university or to Y university. We have the power to go into the uh, admissions officer or to the recruiter who comes around to campus. We have a right to say to him, indeed a duty to say to him, what does this college or university think an educated person ought to know? And how does this college or university get from here to there? What kind of curriculum in place is in place? How is that, that curriculum taught? When we begin to ask those questions, when trustees, a very good point one of the other questioners made, uh, begin to insist that the faculty uh, answer those questions in responsible ways, we'll have gone a great uh, distance toward bringing about change. Yes, so. Lots. I think. What difference did it make? Well, no, that that is a point. But they are still having a problem with it. I don't know what uh, what application figures uh, are. I don't know uh, how much of a problem they're still having. But I read the Stanford uh, alum <laughs> newsletter, and I know they're still madly trying to explain what's going on, and that strikes me as a good sign. And it's still madly going on. Well, how? How many parents in this room uh, would uh, go ahead and send a child to Stanford uh, given the circumstance with the Western Civilization course? I suspect there are quite a lot. You Even have though a, I think this room has proved itself uh, in the... You have a very special selection to, uh, in this room, both, <laughs> well. both on the stage and in the audience. But Lynn, I'd, I'd like to ask you, and, and this kind of... I have to say first that I, I consider that you're doing a marvelous thing at the NEH, and I know that the most immediate uh, sign that you're doing a marvelous thing is that you have come here and are talking seriously and pointedly in a way that I, I cannot remember a public official doing, at least in my experience, on what are very difficult and very loaded, loaded subjects. But just let me ask you, isn't there a conflict between what we all would agree, parents, trustees, ought to do, and the very idea of disinterestedness, that is, isn't in disinterestedness lurking the idea of scholarly objectivity and especially scholarly control of education? What right, I want to know by what right parents can now say that they are objecting. Do they know more than Professor this and President that and Dean so-and-so? Do they know more? When you ask, uh, most 
parents and students why they have chosen a college or university. The factors that are most often cited, uh, first of all, a vaguely conceived notion of prestige. You know, people will say, well, this place is prestigious, but when pinned down, they can't describe exactly what that means. A second article of faith and a second guide that people use in choosing colleges or universities is to go to the most expensive place possible. They uh, equate money with uh, quality. I'm simply suggesting that there are more intelligent approaches, that one might really read the catalog, look at how general education requirements are uh, required to be fulfilled, not pay attention to the rhetoric up front. But, you know, can you fulfill your humanities requirements with uh, courses in home economics, as you can at one university I looked at recently? Can you fill your social science requirements with uh, a course called Inequality in America, which may indeed be a fine course. I can't comment on it without uh, looking at it more fully, but it's too narrow. You don't have an idea of what social sciences are by studying that. Can't, should you be able to fulfill your science requirements by studying drugs and plant hallucinogens, as you can at uh, Rutgers? And their cultivation. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> uh, should you be able to fulfill your science requirements uh, by studying uh, uh, sports in America? you know, uh, the physiology of sports. That may be a good thing to do, but it's too narrow. Look at the catalog, start to pick wisely, pick in educational terms. I don't think that that is a subversion of educational, of uh, academic freedom. Yes, sir. fellow. It is true that English is one of the commonest majors for uh, law school. Uh, for, for good or ill, the humanities are uh, often viewed as pre-professional degrees. They aren't seen as an end in themselves. And uh, it, it, I just, just let me add that just, you know, I'm troubled by what you say. Because in essence, uh, we're saying we have the power to fix the system, except we really can't do it. I mean, you know, it is our system. We're the ones who are paying for it. How sad if we are unable to make it function in uh, the way that common sense would dictate it should. Could, could, could I ask um, a question? Would you agree that ultimately the only way this situation that you and Roger both describe uh, will be dealt with is by the professoriate dealing with it themselves. You see, dealing with? Dealing with this problem, the, the academic problem in the United States, mm -hmm. the one that Roger and uh, Lynn and Gina have been describing. Um, I mean, there is a certain amount that can be done by alumni and parents and so on, but not very much, because the academic profession is very resistant, and uh, it's something can be done by the grant giving bodies and so on. But really, ultimately, the, the remedy is for the generation that is doing what it's doing now to pass away. But that generation is making all the appointments more. I know it is, or to be ridiculed. I mean, Roger does a very good job ridiculing it. Um, and um, other people should ridicule it. But ultimately, it's got to do it itself, hasn't it? Do, 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 would you agree with that? 
I, I simply, uh, well, I would agree, except insofar as this is a consumer-driven system. But the trouble is it isn't really. I mean, it is to some extent. But well, it, if it, it isn't, isn't, it isn't, it's our ultimately. fault. Hmm? If it isn't, it is our fault. You know, we continue to, to make decisions for bad reasons. If we continue to make decisions for bad reasons, then... Uh, well, I would, I would suggest that no longer in, in, in our society do parents care what children learn as long as they do well in life and are, quote, happy, unquote. I would, I would suggest that's the cause of the disaster. The, 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 the cause is that no longer is education seen as in some way helping to replicate the parents' lives. Education is seen as a radical discontinuity with the parents' lives, and properly so. Let, let me uh, introduce a radical discontinuity and uh, observe that one of the hopeful uh, uh, things that has happened on American campuses is that as faculties have become uh, more radicalized, students have become more conservative. I'm, I'm not sure how to explain this. Maybe there's some kind of contrariety at work here uh, where students are determined to run against the current. I'm not sure. but. Um, the, the largest single student organization at Berkeley right now is uh, Young Republicans. <laughs> so I just, I, I, we're getting near the end here. I thought maybe being an eternal optimist, I should introduce an optimistic note. Dean? All of us here are taking it for granted that the institution of the Roger, you, Roger, after all, is just writing, just finished a book called Tenured Radicals. Yeah, yes, I'm afraid I would agree with you. I mean, we, I, re, I agree with you reluctantly because I can see, well, because I think that um, the in, incursion on academic freedom uh, was once a real threat and could again be a real threat, but um, I think that given the complexion of the university today, that tenure no longer does serve the interests of, of either academic freedom for the professorate, nor does it serve the interests of the students who are trying to get an education. Lynn? My point is this, in the profession of journalism and so forth, you've never entertained the idea that there had to be tenure. But in some ways, journalism, in this broad sense, is probably the greatest source of freedom of inquiry, particularly political inquiry. Oh, Dean, have you ever heard of the Newspaper Guild? Mm. Well, the professors have that too. No, but you have you you get tenure at the New York Times by writing in a certain way. Well, let, let me just observe that some of the most interesting questions about tenure and about whether tenure is. Uh, uh, necessary to the university system it is, as it has long been thought to be, are coming from the radical left. Uh, there was a book last year by a professor named Betty Jean Craig called Reconnections that won the prestigious Charles Dana Prize. This book is um, very much of the idea that disinterestedness does not exist, that it is the duty of the college professor to alter society according to his viewpoint in the classroom. And Ms. Craig goes on to argue, given this circumstance, perhaps we, people who would agree with her way of thinking, ought to uh, seriously question the institution of tenure. So you asked the question at a very interesting time, and uh, I think it should continue to be asked. I think we've, we've, we've come to the end. I, I wanted to uh, add to my comments on, uh, on Lynn Cheney that uh, I have also very uh, tender feelings for the other two panelist, Roger, who of course is, 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 is very much involved with us at the New Criterion and brings a kind of energy and a, a kind of insight in, into all of these issues that is, is sorely lacking. And then for Morris Cowling's going back tomorrow to uh, 
to England, back to Cambridge. Um, I think that, that we need many more people who love teaching, which is what Morris, it seems to me, has brought to Columbia and has, has brought to these shores. Uh, he is, I think we could tell in his remarks, that he is someone who finds the very act of being in a university involves teaching and in the most pleasurable sense involves teaching. So I want to thank everyone for coming tonight here on the stage and the audience and I hope we'll see you next week when we might actually have a rather less specific uh, discussion uh, than we had tonight and I, I, I assume it would be as, as interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you. It was nice to hear your ideas. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.